All right, if you got your Bibles, let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we're going to wrap up the last handful of verses here in Romans chapter 4. And uh, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Romans. And I've called this uh, series that I'm doing in Romans, I've called it a letter that changes lives. And um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but we, we ought to look at this book of Romans as a letter that changes lives. I, I hope that it's made a difference in your life. I hope that as we've went through this, that it, that it makes a difference to you. Maybe there's things that you forgot that, that uh, as we've went through this, that you've, you've just kind of, huh, I, I forgot about that. Or maybe you've even seen something that you haven't seen before. But uh, this is a letter that changes lives. And, and you may say, why do we call this a letter? Because Paul wrote this as a letter sending it to uh, uh, these people here in Romans. And he uh, writes it as a letter, and, and these people received it with great anticipation. And today we may not get letters, but we get text messages and we get emails, and, and we look at those a lot of times with anticipation. So I'm going to pick up at verse number 16. We left off of verse 15 last week. Uh, verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace... To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to uh, that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he uh, believed, even God who quickened, uh, quickeneth excuse me, the dead, and calleth those things which are not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was yet a hundred years old, neither uh, yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. So the title of the message today is the product of, of strong faith. Last week we looked at how to have strong faith, kind of what that means. And, and this week we're, we're seeing that manifested or, or we're seeing that played out here. The product of strong faith. I'm going to pray once again and uh, we'll get in further into the message. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day and uh, this time. Lord, I, I pray that you would help me to deliver this message. Help me to say what you want said. Keep me from saying anything you don't want said today. Uh, may the truth of your word encourage us and inspire us, Lord. We need to be uh, a people that seeks you. We need to be a people praying for one another. Uh, we need to be a people loving one another in spite of our faults, in spite of our frustrations, and in spite of uh, uh, whatever uh, is going on. Lord, I know there's people that are hurting this morning. I know there's people that are discouraged. I know there's people that are frustrated. And I pray that... Uh, your word would, would bring encouragement today and that uh, as we look to you and we know that our salvation is, is, a, is definitely a product of our faith and I pray that uh, each person here uh, has that relationship with you, Lord. We love you, we thank you. Uh, use the rest of this time for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I talk about uh, this message being called the product of strong faith. I came across some kind of humorous labels that talk about products. And here's a few that I came across. On a, on a bar of dial soap, the, the instructions, destructions, instructions say this, use like regular soap. Why would you have that on a bar of soap? On uh, Tesco's tiramisu dessert, printed on the bottom of the box, it says, do not turn upside down. 
on uh, Marks and Spencer's bread pudding. Product will be hot after heating. Uh, on a Korean kitchen knife, warning, keep out of children. <laughs> on a string of Chinese-made Christmas lights for indoor or outdoor use only. On a Japanese food processor, not to be used for other use. On Sansbury peanuts, and this is, this is the one that confuses me the most about explaining the product. On Sansbury's peanuts, it says, warning... Product contains nuts. Why is that one on there? So these labels explain something about the product. We're going to examine the product of strong faith today. It's important to see exactly what it is that faith should be producing in our lives. So there's four things I'd like to point out about the product of strong faith. And, and, and it's not just mustering up faith in, in your own uh, flesh and and, and we've heard people talk about faith, and we've heard probably good things over the years. I think we've heard some flesh-dependent things in, in church over the years. Uh, when, when my, I'm going to share this. I try to stay away from personal illustrations, but sometimes it's just so applicable. Uh, when my mom died, the uh, pastor we had at the time, he wasn't our pastor very long after he said this to my dad, but he said to my dad, you just didn't have enough faith. Uh, that's, that was the wrong thing to say because it wasn't a faith issue. So it's not about mustering up something in ourselves. Faith is dependence. Just to kind of recap what we talked a little bit about last week. Faith is dependence. And, and it's all about where, where, what is your object of dependence today? What are you depending on? All of you are sitting in a pew. You're depending on that pew. So the first thing I see here about the product of strong faith is we see here that grace... That is access. Number one, we see the grace that is access. Which, by the way, when you think about what's, what should my faith be producing in my life? What should happen as I'm placing my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? You should have grace come into your life. You should have saving grace. You have a home in heaven. You're born again. You're a child of God. Uh, you're, you're, you're a new creature, the Bible tells us. So you have that grace channeled into your life because of your faith in Jesus Christ. You also have a sustaining uh, faith. We see here the grace that is access. Look with me at verse 16. Therefore it is of faith. So we talked a lot about faith last week. Uh, so it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to only that which is of the law, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's, those are some very important statements there, because he's not just talking about Jewish people. He's talking about everybody, which we'll get to here in a minute. Verse 17, As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead. That's a very important phrase, quickeneth the dead. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And calleth those things to be, not as though they were. The greatest gift we can access this morning is the grace of God. We see a couple things here. The ability that is given in verse 16. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 kind of explains this for us when it tells us, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we see that word quickened a couple times, right? Well, what does that mean? Is it like quicken the computer program? No, it's on the bottom of your fingernail, there's a quick that's there. That's where the blood flows up out from the, the root there, I guess you could say, to the rest of your fingernail. So when it goes down to like the quick, have you ever pulled a, maybe you've not done this, but you've pulled a fingernail and it goes down to the quick, that hurts. It it's not, doesn't feel very good. So uh, that, there's an ability that is given. So a couple things about this that we need to understand. Humans must respond by faith. And we must respond by faith to God's promise. The promise was certain to all of Abraham's descendants, both Jew and Gentile, of Abraham who ex ex exercised faith. And now Abraham was the illustration, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, an illustration of faith. This was a man who was called later in life to uh, leave and go to a different land. This was a man who was getting ready for retirement. We see in this passage we read, he was not a young man. He was 100 years old. And God's telling him, I'm going to get you basically ready to start a family. Who starts a family at 100 years old? 
You don't see that go on today. And, and rightfully so. But that's what God told them to do. And, and there was a process that God worked through in their lives. And they held on to that promise. And God made him a father of many nations. So this ability that's given, it's an ability that it goes far beyond what I can even describe to you today. It goes far beyond what man can explain. It goes far, far beyond uh, even, even our understanding. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 28 talks about how God works. It says that in the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, in the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. So in other words here, the glory of God manifests itself in such a way that only God gets the glory. Meaning He gets the attention, He gets the praise, and He gets the honor. If we can boast and glory of ourselves and explain how good we are or how we got something done, then chances are it may not be of God. And that's a hard pill sometimes to swallow in a, in a world that wants to uh, uh, tell you how good you are and, and, and just wants to uh, use self-esteem when really it needs to be all about God-esteem. It's really about uh, how He's worked in our lives. Uh, the grace of the excess, it's excess excuse me, is not just the ability given, as we see in verse 16, but it's accessible to all. Or excuse me, uh, we're in Romans. Genesis 17 and verse 5, we, we had read some passages out of Genesis last couple weeks that talk about Abraham and what he's done. But in chapter 17 of Genesis and verse 5 says, Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. We need to understand that this is important because... He's wanting to make Abraham a father of many nations. The Jews were a nation. This all came before the law. So God's intention is that the blessing, the plans that He has, that it's supposed to be accessible to everyone. God wanted to use Abraham. God wanted to use the Jewish people to make Him known to all the nations. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. A verse which we're going to read a couple of times today. This is meant for everyone to partake in. God is willing that no man perish this morning. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter uh, what childhood you had or didn't have. None of that matters. What matters is what is your object of faith today? That's what matters. And we all have that access through the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, we see the faith that is accounted for. The faith that is accounted for. Look at verse 18. This is talking about Abraham who against hope believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. We read that and think, sounds nice. This guy's a hundred years old when he's reading this. Or when he's saying this. Uh, look at verse uh, 19. And, not, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred uh, years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. You see here, faith that's accounted for. This shows us that faith does not mean doing nothing. But in doing all, in trusting and reliance on God for his miraculous work. Abraham had to look at things the way that God did. We see here a couple of things about the fact that there's this grace that's accounted for. And, and grace meaning that supernatural enabling that we get to do God's will. It's to get saved. It's to live how we need to live. It's to be the type of person God wants us to be, to be Christ-like. That's what grace is to be channeled into our lives. We see that the object here, the object of our faith is greater. Abraham had to have his eyes on one greater than himself. Proverbs 13 and verse 12 says, Hope deferred. Hope deferred. That's not a good term here. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. Friends, if there's no hope, we don't have that relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says our heart's sick. Does this not describe so many in our community? And I don't say this to look down on, on anyone this morning. I say that to say that uh, we've got a task before us to take the Lord to people. We have a task before us to try to uh, love people 
and to share the gospel where, where we can. When we see people on, on strung out on drugs, or we see people in a, in a hotel room just having a party, playing loud music, and I'm not saying I'm against loud music, but listen to what's tied to it, just the alcohol flowing and fighting. That sounds to me like a heart that's sick. You know why? Because the hope's not their trust, their dependence. Because hope is an expectation. Hope is something you go to so that you're not hopeless. And when we don't go to the Lord, we go to something that's just going to make our heart sick. But the, the, the author in Proverbs doesn't stop there. He says, but when the desire cometh, meaning when you, when you, turn, to, when you turn to something you can trust in, he says, it is a tree of life. Abraham had to have his eyes on one greater than himself. And when I read that passage and I think about how Abraham had to have his eyes and his focus on the Lord. You know, a tree, most of the time when a tree bears fruit anyhow, it's, it's bigger than we are. It produces fruit. When you plant a pear tree... I say this because my dad used to have a pear tree in the yard and he used to always say, pear don't fall far from the tree. So when he had that pear tree in the yard, he, he expected pears to come from that tree. You have apples, you expect apples to come from that tree. Mark chapter 9, verses 23 through 24, And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So the, the, the guy here in this passage from Mark, we, we went over this quite a while back, but the guy in Mark had this sick child. And, and uh, the Lord tells him to, to believe. And if you believe here that all things are possible to him that believes. And this guy struggled with his belief so much that he said, Lord, help my unbelief. Sometimes that's how we need to pray. There's nothing wrong with saying, Lord, here's my situation. And laying it out. And saying, help my unbelief. I'm having trouble seeing you in this situation. I'm having trouble understanding what you're trying to show me. Lord, help me out here. I need your grace. I need your mercy. A couple Wednesdays ago, I talked about mercy on our, on our live prayer feed on, on Facebook Live and how Jacob in the Old Testament had all these sons and he sends them to, to Egypt because there's a famine. And he actually prays for God's mercy over these children. Apparently, Abraham here failed, or excuse me, refused to dwell in the negative. He didn't fail. I just misread my notes here. He refused to dwell in the negative. God had given him a promise, and that was enough for him once he grabbed a hold of it. What a lesson for us today. There's reward for resting in the Savior. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, it says about Abraham, he believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted it. He, he put, set it to his account for righteousness. He counted it to him for righteousness. I like what one Bible commentator said. He said that sense corrects imagination, reason corrects sense, but faith corrects both. It will not be, saith the sense, it cannot be, saith the reason. It both can and will be, says the faith, for I have a promise in it. Listen, if, if we're going to hold to the faith that we need to have to access grace, that product of faith this morning, it has to be in the Word of God. You've got to be in God's Word. You've got to be praying uh, to the Lord. It can't just be, well, I'm just going to believe. There's a lot of things out there you can quote-unquote believe in. But our faith has got to be firmly and fully anchored on the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Abraham believed with the intention of receiving it. Faith alone doesn't produce anything. It takes a hold of what is already offered. What does all this say to us? That faith is a battle. Faith is a struggle. There will be doubts this morning. There will be times where we feel like giving up. When we've, and, and there will be times we feel like giving in to those doubts. But real faith stays anchored. It goes back to the promises in God's Word. It goes back to believing truth over feeling. 
It always rests in the knowledge that God will do exactly what He's promised to do. Sometimes I have to trust in the Lord and just be content. Number three, grace that empowers. Look at verse 20 through 22. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to also perform. And therefore it was imputed, given unto him, in other words, for righteousness. Abraham believed for 25 years with the knowledge one day God would give him and Sarah a child. He refused to let go of this promise and this truth that God had given him. Grace that empowers. We must learn what faith is. Hebrews 11 and verse 1, once again, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is built up, it is made up of what you trust in. The evidence of things not seen. I used this illustration last week, and those of you here last week, I'm sorry, I'm going to use it again. But I don't understand a brake system on a car. I'm, I'm pretty ignorant. But I still use, push on that, that brake pedal. I don't think about it. I just push on that brake pedal when I need to slow down or stop. We need to learn that nothing else pleases the Lord. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. And he that is that is and he and that he, excuse me, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And we must remember that anything less is sin; it's falling short. Hebrew, or excuse me, Romans fourteen verse twenty three. Uh, he that doubteth is damned if he eat. That doesn't mean eat food. He's talking about partaking of that doubting. That if you consume the doubt, listen, we're going to have times we doubt. If you study Abraham's life, he had he had moments when he doubted. But the issue is, what do you do when the doubts come? Do we give in to the doubts or do we return to God's Word? Do we return to that promise? Because he eateth or partaketh not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And then simply take God at His Word and hold on. In Hebrews 11, this is a verse you might want to mark down. Because this really gives commentary into the life of Abraham in Genesis. When he takes Isaac up and he offers Isaac up as a sacrifice to God which seems like a, like a, to us like a barbaric practice. But uh, this is what God told him to do. And right before Abraham was going to kill his son and offer him up, there was a ram that was uh, caught in the thickets that was a suitable sacrifice. But listen to what the Word of God tells us in Hebrews 11, 17-19. It says, By faith Abraham, when he tried, offered up Isaac, and that he received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Does that sound familiar? John 3.16 tells us that Jesus is God's only begotten Son. So we see a picture here, a type of Christ, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So why, why would he do this? Okay, it says, I'm going to give you this son. He's gonna, you're going to be a father of many nations. It's going to come through Isaac. And then God says, offer him up. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. So Abraham did this believing that God could resurrect Isaac. It's pretty clear that's what God's Word's telling us here. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And when he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. Which leads me to the last thing, number four, the faith, or excuse me, the grace that keeps. The grace that keeps. This is a sustaining grace. Look at verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed unto him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. We see in these verses that the power of God not only raises Jesus Christ from the dead, but it also preserves those of us who have placed our faith Our dependence, our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 2 and verse 24 tells us, In whom God hath raised up, having loosened the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Jesus, having paid the debt of man's sin, death had no claim on him, because he had not sinned himself. Romans 6.23 tells us that. 
His work on the cross, meaning He was delivered up for our offenses and triumph over sin and death, raised because of our justification is what saves us. We must recognize today that we're a sinner. That we deserve hell. And, and Jesus went to that cross so you didn't have to go there. But you have to trust in Him. I could lay a $100 bill out here on this table and say it's yours. But it's really not yours until you take it. You could say, well, I think it's fake money. You could say, I don't need your $100 bill. You could say, I think you're a liar. I think you're whatever. Or you can take that, trust in it, take it to the bank, or whatever you want to do with it. Go buy, go buy McDonald's with it, whatever, whatever the case is. But you have to take hold of that dollar for it to be yours. And you have to place your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation from, from sin, and salvation from hell and, and torture. You know, faith in just the historic works of Jesus will not save. Faith in the beauty of Jesus' life won't save. There's so many religions that acknowledge the two things I just mentioned. About, oh, I believe Jesus was a, was a great person. Oh, I believe He really was here. Faith in the accuracy of His teaching doesn't even save. There's people that say, oh, He was such a great teacher. Faith in the deity of Jesus and His Lordship according to one Bible commentator alone isn't enough to save. There's people that will say, yeah, I believe He's God. But we have to come to Him realizing we need Him to save us. And we have to realize that He died for our sins. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 tells us, Now the God of peace that brought Him again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Don't you love that term? An everlasting covenant. Make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In closing, Paul's conclusion to this chapter makes it clear of nothing else or excuse me, that nothing else or no one, no one else will work. Salvation must come through saving faith in Jesus Christ alone. Abraham believed and was saved. It wasn't Abraham's works. It wasn't anything Abraham did. Because we know the Bible tells us that, that he knew he couldn't please God except apart from faith. It wasn't the law. You may say, how wasn't the law? It wasn't even there yet. The law didn't come till. Way later on, we're, in, we're talking about stuff that went on in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15. The law is a long ways away. It was faith then. It is faith now. So where's our faith at today? Where's, where's our dependence at today? The Muslim puts faith in the Quran and Muhammad. The Buddhist puts faith in graven image, images. The humanist puts faith in himself. A religious man puts faith in his works. A materialist puts faith in his wealth. But a true spiritual life of faith is only as good as its object. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the Bible tells us. You simply have to put your trust in Him today. You may say, how do I do that? Trust in your heart and call out to Him today. Call out to Him to save you. Call out to Him in your situation. Maybe you're in a situation where uh, you know you're saved. It's, that's not the issue. Uh, you know you have a home in heaven. And that's a great thing to have. But you need to lift your situation up to Him and, and trust Him. And, and, and lay it out there to Him. Maybe you've doubted your salvation. You need to come to Him with your whole heart. Trust in Him. Knowing that He alone is able to save you. Let's pray.